Hi, welcome to session 13 of Pirates, Smugglers, and the Making of the Modern World. Today is the last session of the course, and if your memory takes you back to the first session, you'll see some similarities to what I did on that first session and what I'm going to do today in this sense. And in the first session, we had a broad overview of the course, and in the second part of that same session, I went over basically what grading standards were, how to study for exams, etc. We're going to do something similar today. Uh, the first half is going to be a broad summary of the course, a little bit like what we did at the beginning, but now we've got all this information to plug in in terms of the major concepts that we've dealt with in terms of pirates and smuggling and, of course, the making of the modern world. And then in the second half of today's session, what I'm going to do is a review, although this review is going to focus entirely on the second half of the course, because, of course, the final exam focuses only on the second half of the course. So we'll first get a summary, then we'll go back and review material from the second half to help prepare you for the final exam. So let's begin. First of all, I'm taking this slide right from the first session because it talks about the objectives of the course. What have we tried to accomplish? over the 13 weeks. And we'll see how those objectives have been fulfilled and what kinds of concepts and ideas are we able to attach to these broader themes. First of all, we've talked about the causes of piracy and smuggling, and we're going to review those today, uh, both in terms of issues such as economic issues, uh, but also political issues. As we've seen, there are some sort of standard economic rules of thumb, if you will, that help determine when piracy and smuggling are going to occur. And at the same time, we also know that state systems have played a major role, either because they have promoted allowed smuggling and piracy or because they have simply established certain economic policies, for example, such as monopolies, high tariff walls, that create ideal conditions for smuggling to occur even if that is not the state's intention. So we're going to look at these basic economic and political issues that contribute to the outbreaks of smuggling and piracy from the time of uh, the Barbarossas back in the 1500s all the way down to the late 20th and beginning of the 21st century. Secondly, something that we looked at, particularly in the second half of the course, is the social history of pirates. In other words, who are these people as human cultures, as human societies? What kinds of values did they share? What kinds of relationships did they develop? How did they see themselves within the context of the larger human society in which they lived? How can we compare and contrast them with the types of cultures and societies that existed around them, the ones that were considered the dominant ones, whereas these are considered subordinate cultures or outside societies, uh, groups that are alienated from the larger society. How do we relate them to the larger realities of the world around them? We're going to look back at what we discovered in regards to the makeup, the values of pirate societies. Thirdly, we've been talking really from the beginning of the course, about the making of the modern world. From the age of trading empires, all the way back to 1200 AD, up until 1700s, we've looked at free trade and the era of globalization, and considered how these developments, these larger global developments, particularly involving economic change in the world system, how these have contributed to, in various ways, either the rise of piracy and smuggling, or at times, such as during the era of free trade in the latter half of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, how such a period contributes to the decline of piracy and smuggling. So we want to look at those broad concepts. To what extent have they been useful in helping us understand the process of economic change in the world over the last 500 years? And by the same token, we should also think about the fact that pirates and smugglers help us understand that larger world system that has evolved over the past 500 years. In other words, when we see people engaging in acts of piracy and smuggling on a large scale, a broad scale, we begin to understand that they are reacting to certain conditions they find in the world around them. So their activities help us understand what the effects are of these larger systems, how human beings were affected, and how they responded to those conditions that they found in the world around them. So there's a dual aspect to this. Uh, 
understanding the logic of world systems helps us understand piracy and smuggling. At the same time, piracy and smuggling helps give us insight into what the human effects were of those global systems over the centuries since about 1500. And then, of course, we have focused, particularly in the very last part of the course, the last few sessions, on modern pirates and smugglers. Looked at the fact that modern pirates don't necessarily, you know, swashbuckle. They're not running around with swords in their hands and patches over their eyes, seizing ships, although there are still some people doing that type of activity in the world. But rather, piracy in a very different modern form, and that is the piracy particularly of consumer goods, creating counterfeit goods, creating counterfeit trademarks. Uh, these kinds of activities are what we looked at in the latter part of the course, along with causes of modern day smuggling that at times seem to run contrary to that sort of golden rule that smuggling breaks out when tariffs and uh, other barriers to trade are high and create high prices. It would appear at least that in the last quarter of the 20th century we had a huge outbreak of smuggling even though globalization was supposedly lowering tariff barriers and other barriers to trade around the world. And we'll again get back into well how do these two ideas uh, relate to each other, how can one explain the other, that we have globalization and yet it seems to promote smuggling rather than reducing it. We'll get back into that idea as well. First of all, let's talk about global systems that have been so important in understanding the backdrop, the background, the piracy and smuggling. We can talk about trading empires, about free trade, and free trade and with that globalization we're just talking about similar kinds of processes but we're talking in one case about the 19th century turn of the 20th century and then with globalization we're talking the second half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century and we are talking in that latter stage about not only trade but also foreign investment as well and opening up the doors to foreign investment as well as foreign trade. We've also seen the rise of a global effort to control certain substances, particularly drugs that we have talked about at length in the last couple of weeks, uh, things like cocaine and heroin, etc. That all of these systems, however we might want to describe them in other terms, and as different as they may seem to be with trading empires trying to cut off or limit trade, have exclusive trading agreements, globalization opening the system up, as different as they may seem, First of all, we know they have in common the fact that they do affect much of the world at the same time, whether it's trading empires in the 1500s or globalization in the second half of the 20th century. One thing that's common to these systems is that there are rules of entry, in other words, rules of the game, that you can't participate unless you follow certain rules. There are guidelines, not anyone is free to participate in these systems, as different as they may seem. For trading empires, we already know pretty much what those rules are, that we have exclusive trading agreements. In other words, empires are set up in which, for example, colonial powers like England and France establish exclusive, Spain would be another example, they establish exclusive trading relationships with colonies that they have. They also establish or tend to establish monopolies, such as the Portuguese tried to establish over the spice trade in the Pacific through Asia beginning in the 1500s. That kind of exclusiveness is also common to these trading empires. And there's also the imposition of embargoes, oftentimes in trading empires. In other words, if we look at China and look at China's experience with places like Japan that periodically because of conflict uh, they would shut off trade with Japan or other areas. This kind of embargo is also a common feature of trading empires during their heyday in the early modern world. Now, we know that this type of exclusivist trade, whether it was done through uh, excluded areas in terms of trade, embargoes, etc., monopolies, we know that it tends to encourage smuggling and piracy. We tend to look upon the legitimate trade, as it might be called, within such a trading empire as a system opposed to the so-called illegitimate trade of pirates and smugglers. And yet we have found that in fact they are two parts of the same system. That in many ways one can't exist without the other. Pirates and smugglers usually can't exist unless for some reason, whatever the reason might be, 
the state decides not to fully enforce its rules about exclusivist trading empires, monopolies, etc. It allows some of this to go on, might even encourage it for certain reasons that we've seen. On the other hand, it's also true that the smugglers and pirates help these trading empires survive by reconciling certain irrationalities in these systems. The fact that a trading empire is unable to supply sufficient products to the colonists within the system is compensated for by smugglers and pirates like Sir Francis Drake, etc., uh, who went to the New World and provided badly needed supplies for colonists in the Spanish Empire. So there is a symbiotic relationship between these two systems, if you will, what are really two parts of the same system. They actually help reinforce each other, help each other to survive. Now, we have tended to make a clear division between trading empires and their exclusivist relationships and globalization, free trade, that occurred in the 19th and 20th centuries. And yet, we might use the expression from Shakespeare, doesn't arose by any other name, smell as sweet. In other words, we might well be dealing with systems that are not very different from each other, even though we see one as exclusivist and the other, free trade and globalization, as sort of opening up world trade. They may not be that different after all. And what we want to do is look at the major examples of this, uh, the British and American experiences, the British experience with free trade, American experience as the leader of the process of globalization in the 20th century. Are they, in fact, simply forms of empire themselves, just as the trading empires were? We know already that they have rules of entry in both cases. We're going to see that, in fact, there are specific rules of entry even for free trade systems and for globalization. First of all, the British experience was one where free trade was meant, of course, to benefit the British because the British held the dominant position in the world economy in the 19th century. This is why the British were promoting free trade. So clearly this isn't just an objective, uh, impartial type of policy meant to benefit all, as much as, of course, free trade theory promoted that idea. In fact, the British were promoting free trade precisely because they knew they had an enormous competitive advantage and that anyone that opened themselves up to trade with Britain was going to be at a disadvantage in terms of the terms of trade that would be created under the free trade system. So it isn't as if this is simply an impartial system that evolves out of nowhere. In fact, it's being promoted, pushed, even imposed at times by the British to suit their interests. And there are rules of the game. As long as countries, such as the countries of Latin America, open themselves up willingly and freely to free trade, that's not a big problem. British aren't going to intervene. But in cases where countries resist opening themselves up to a free trade regime, such as China, then the British are quite willing to use force. So this is not you know, free trade in the sense you're free to do it or not. Uh, when the Chinese oppose the expansion of trade with the British, and particularly, of course, uh, the trade in opium, the British launch a military action against the Chinese to essentially force open the ports of China and force China to accept more open trade relationships with England and other parts of Europe. So these systems are not entirely open as they seem. In fact, people are sometimes forced into them. A similar kind of situation exists with the United States and its emphasis on internationalism, the promotion of free trade in products, free and open access for foreign investment in countries around the world, free exchange of ideas. Again, it sounds like a very good, impartial, objective system, but in fact, it's done to promote the interests of the United States because the United States has found itself here in the 20th century and in the beginning of the 21st century as the dominant world power. And therefore, of course, it again sees itself in, as a highly advantageous situation. The more open the world's economies, the more the United States can benefit from that because it has such a substantial lead in key sectors of economic growth. Now, the United States came to embrace free trade long before the 20th century. In fact, back in the 19th century and even at the end of the 18th century, the U.S. was a promoter of free trade activity in most parts of the world. That grew out 
in part from the U.S.'s colonial experience as a collection of British colonies, uh, the Americans were well aware of the disadvantages of closed trading empires that they had themselves suffered the disadvantages of such a system under British trade rules, as we've seen in the coming of the American Revolution. In addition, after the United States achieved independence, and especially during the 19th century, it found its international opportunities hemmed in by the existence of colonial empires around the globe that excluded the Americans, of course, from trade within those systems. So there were good and valid reasons why the United States was promoting free trade even during the 19th century, even before it became the dominant economic power in the world. American leaders also came to the conclusion that a free trade empire, if you will, was far less expensive than the kinds of colonial empires that the British, the French, the Germans, and others were creating because it didn't really come with huge administrative costs. So the Americans are, for a variety of practical reasons, promoting the idea of global free trade. Once the United States achieves a dominant position in the world, and certainly by the 1920s, it was becoming the leading industrial power in the world, it was becoming the financial center of the world, etc., as those conditions emerge, the United States has all the more reason to want to promote free trade, want to promote an open world economy, as its industries, such as the electrical industry, the chemical industry, etc., become the dominant innovators in their sectors, these types of economic enterprise have all the more reason to want to promote the same kind of open system to be able to invest around the globe where they know they have huge competitive advantages. With the end of World War II, the United States really had a grand opportunity to create the kind of system that it had long envisioned. This is the reason for the Marshall Plan and for aid to Japan because, of course, to keep this open free trade system going, it was going to need substantial economic partners in Europe and in Japan. So to help rebuild their economies on a capitalist basis was in the interest of the United States to help create a dynamic world economy and with allies who would promote the same kind of open investment and open trade strategy. In addition, the U.S. helped create a series of organizations, multilateral organizations, and mean drawing their membership from a number of different countries that would promote these same ideals. So the World Trade Organization it was known as GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade at one time, now the World Trade Organization. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And there were also U.S. federal agencies uh, that did the same kinds of things. For example, the United States Agency for International Development. All of these groups, including the multilateral groups, had strings attached to the aid that they would provide, whether it's development loans, development grants, uh, loans to secure uh, financial systems which are near bankruptcy because of indebtedness, and countries that are suffering from currency depreciation. All of these types of loans and aid have strings attached. You have to open up your economy. You have to reduce the role of the state, increase the role of foreign investment, and create a general free enterprise, free trade system within your society if you want to be a recipient, recipient of this kind of support. So all of these institutions are designed to promote the same kinds of ideas. And ultimately, in particular, the concept of consumerism, as I put it here, consumerism uber alles. In other words, consumerism was to become the defining economic social and even cultural principle that would be promoted by the United States around the world. That human happiness is to be achieved by the consumption of goods and services within the capitalist economy. This isn't just a matter of buying goods for need, it's a matter of buying products because it is the cost to human happiness. This was promoted in lieu of a variety of other cultural values and beliefs that reigned across the world and are still vibrant in much of the world, but this was to be the guiding philosophy of this new globalized economy and society. At the same time, just as trading empires had rules of the game, so does this globalized system. We saw this, for example, in the Cold War, that a series of societies in the world, the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, Eastern Europe, had set up socialist economies and societies, were largely walling themselves off from this new global system that the United States was trying to create. And out of that 
came the Cold War, this battle over which system was going to dominate. Was it going to be a capitalist, free trade, uh, open investment kind of world economy, or would it be a closed socialist system? That war, of course, has come to an end in the past 15 years or so as the Soviet Union collapsed and as China increasingly came to accept ideas of free trade and foreign investment and capitalist enterprise. But it was clear that these societies were not going to be given a place in the larger world system as long as they continued to maintain the sort of exclusivist socialist system that they had. Just as China was not going to be allowed to wall itself off from free trade in the time of British dominance. Similar kinds of approaches, although more subtle in most cases, were used in regards to third world countries, although most of them were not following a strictly communist or socialist ideology. Nevertheless, uh, their version of third world nationalism meant that they were promoting state-driven economies, they were limiting access to foreign investment, they were in fact controlling exchange rates, etc., to limit uh, imports of foreign goods. We've seen this with import substitution industrialization. And the United States and these multilateral institutions for decades uh, essentially warred on these ideas, trying to bring these policies to an end, and have been substantially successful in doing so over the last couple of decades. The war on drugs is another example of a global system because the effort to interdict drugs, to limit the use of drugs is really being done on a worldwide scale and being promoted particularly by the United States. So here again we have an exclusivist system, in this case uh, creating an embargo, if you will, saying no, trade with, in that particular substance or set of substances is illegal and illegal on a global basis. Again, you have to play by the rules, otherwise you can't be a part of the system. So as much as globalization is uh, an outgrowth of free trade, we also recognize that just as with trading empires, there are rules, there are strictures, there are those groups that are going to benefit most heavily, uh, particularly the developed countries, from this new globalized system, and that it can and does penalize those who do not play by the game, who do not want to play by the rules of this new global system. As different as it may seem from trading empires, it's not all that different. There are winners, there are losers, there are rules of entry and there are rules of the game that you must play by, otherwise you're excluded. So if we go from Istanbul to London to Washington, in other words, go from the Ottoman Empire to the British Empire uh, to what most people now recognize as an American Empire of the 21st century, we see very similar kinds of basic principles, whether we're talking about trading empires or a system like globalization. They may appear to be radically different on the surface, and certainly some of their operating principles are different. But many of the effects in terms of certain groups dominating and benefiting from the system, and rules of entry and rules of behavior within the system, those kinds of characteristics are common to both the globalization system of our time as much as they were applicable to the Ottoman Empire and the Spanish Empire, the trading empires of the past. So the more things change, in some ways, the more they remain the same. Now, what about the economic rules of the game? Uh, we've seen sort of the basic rules for both trading empires and globalization that they're not that different. But what are the basic economic rules about smuggling? First, and the golden rule. Restrictions of free markets and free trade encourage smuggling and piracy by creating artificial price differentials. This is something we've seen time and again whether it's, again, the Portuguese creating a, or trying to create a monopoly in spices, the Spanish with their exclusivist trade system, with their colonies in the Western Hemisphere, or with third world countries erecting high tariff barriers or using exchange rates. However you want to do it, the fact is when you create those barriers to trade, you artificially inflate the price of the products that are affected, and immediately you have an encouragement to piracy and smuggling. Suddenly goods have become much more valuable. Suddenly you have instances where pirates can benefit enormously by seizing certain vessels because of the inflated prices created by these exclusivist systems. Suddenly you have time after time the ideal incentive for smuggling and that is that smuggled goods will be so much cheaper than the legitimately imported goods because of the barriers created by trading empires, by third world nations, 
whatever the circumstances may be. Once those barriers are there, the incentive to piracy and smuggling goes with it. All of this we see in situations such as closed trading relationships, such as the trading empires, the monopolies that they created, the embargoes that they imposed. We see it more recently, centuries, in more recent centuries, with tariffs, with bans on certain products, and we can talk about, you know, tobacco in the age of James I, or we can talk about banned substances today in 21st century America. In addition to bans, we have quotas, in other words, limiting imports of certain goods, and we have seen this down through the centuries. And, of course, a modern tool that's used, exchange controls. In other words, setting certain rates for foreign exchange, thereby impeding imports of certain goods by setting a specific exchange rate for certain goods. So there are all kinds of mechanisms that can be used, whether we're talking about the 1500s or the 21st century. But whatever the mechanisms may be, they all contribute to the same process, that they all contribute to artificially high prices for certain types of goods, and as a result, they are an inducement to smuggling and certainly, in many cases, to piracy. Now, what about some facilitating factors? In other words, factors that assist. They may not, we know the core issue here is, all right, we have price differentials created by trade barriers, however, whatever mechanism is going to be used. But what other factors help smuggling and piracy along, make it easier to do? Well, one that we've seen time and again is tacit approval of the state. In other words, the state essentially accepts the fact that there's going to be a certain amount of piracy and smuggling. Oftentimes, this is simply an acknowledgement that a certain amount of piracy and smuggling is bound to go on. Reducing it below a certain level is simply too costly, too much of an expenditure of men, material, to try to control smuggling and piracy below a certain level. So to some degree, governments accept it simply because it would be extremely expensive to get rid of all of it, to completely wipe it out. There are also limited state policies. In other words, states recognizing the limits to what they can do realistically. Uh, when we were looking at England and the development of its custom system, and we talked about how uh, the custom system was largely focused on London and then a few other key ports, but there are all kinds of small ports in England which for centuries had no official customs representative there because the state recognized there was only so much it could do in terms of expanding and trying to control the problem of smuggling of goods. Until the state was more powerful, it simply had to accept that reality of its own limits. Another characteristic that we have seen in many instances that promotes uh, piracy and smuggling is weakened states. If we look at China, when we looked at the uh, pirates of the South China Sea, you remember that China had been in serious decline by the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, the government was increasingly weakened. The dynasty would be collapsing within 100 years. We've looked more recently at the collapse of the Soviet Union and the explosion of modern-day piracy and smuggling there. We have looked at Colombia and the weakening of the government there and the flourishing of the drug trade within that type of weakened state. So sometimes it's not logical resource allocation saying, well, it's not worth it to reduce smuggling beyond a certain level of piracy. Uh, sometimes it's not a recognition of the limits of state power. But sometimes it may simply be the state is simply incapable of exercising the kind of control over its own economy that would allow it to substantially reduce piracy and smuggling. Uh, another factor that we've seen for centuries, we can go back and look at the American Revolution, we can come up right up to the present where we talked about free trade zones such as in Panama, free zones have been a constant inducement to smuggling in particular because they allow, of course, free import and export of goods and they create an environment where there is a high level, high volume of trade going in and out of a port, and it's occurring almost inevitably near high tariff, high import barrier economies. Therefore, it's an ideal location from which smugglers can operate and readily move their goods from an area that is not closely regulating them into an area where, in fact, those goods are banned or are being heavily taxed. And then we've seen, in a variety of historical contexts, the rise of consumer culture. We could go back, again, to England under James I and talk about tea and tobacco, 
And we're looking at early examples of consumerism, although these would hardly be described as consumer societies. And consumerism was not the driving economic force of these societies. But nevertheless, human beings are consuming certain products. They have a taste for those products, a demand for them. And despite the state's best efforts, it's going to be very difficult to convince millions of Englishmen, English people in the end, that they should stop drinking tea or stop smoking. Uh, in the late 20th, beginning of the 21st century, we see an explosive growth in consumerism, not merely in our own society, but across the globe. Now you've got hundreds and hundreds of millions of people around the world who expect to have access to consumer goods and who provide an enormous market for these kinds of products. And these, of course, are precisely the kinds of products that have often been seriously taxed or banned by economies trying to develop their own industrial base. So even with free trade and globalization, we still have restrictions on the free access and movement of goods. For example, disadvantageous terms of trade often lead third world countries to establish trade barriers, limiting consumer products, as we just saw. At the same time, we have an insistence by developed countries in particular, like the United States and England and Germany, France, Japan, for the protection of their intellectual property rights. And that, of course, means essentially that these goods have exclusivity attached to them. In other words, you can't just go out and copy uh, Microsoft software. Now, we don't want you doing that. We're developing laws. These countries have been trying for years to establish a tight international system uh, that would ban such use, what they consider illegal use, of trademarks and patents and copyrights. So again, even in globalization and free trade, we have these same kinds of restrictions that encourage the smuggling and piracy of goods. Controlled substances represent yet another example of this, even in the age of globalization. In many ways, controlled substances uh, and the policies on controlled substances represent forms of embargoes and forms of monopolies that we're saying we have a right to exclude all such product from not only our economy, but globally. So this has the same effect as saying, well, we have exclusive control over this product. Instead, we're saying there's going to be universal ban on the product. It has the same effect. It's going to drive up prices of these products the more that ex exclusivity is imposed. And that is what is happening in the late 20th and early 21st century as the continuance of the war on drugs uh, spreads not only in the Western Hemisphere, but to much of the globe. Uh, just recently, Americans are trying to cope with uh, the fact that uh, poppy fields are blooming in Afghanistan and what can they do to try to eliminate uh, that product there and its introduction into the world trade uh, of drugs. So we see this is indeed a global system and again has an impact on prices of these goods and will inevitably encourage increased smuggling of such products. Now, we also see on the other hand that as much as smuggling may be driven by certain factors, both economic and political, it is also true that it has beneficial effects, particularly the rationalization of these international systems, whether we're talking trading empires or we're talking globalization. In trading empires, as we've seen, smuggling and piracy help prevent scarcity and they help reduce monopoly pricing. They make these systems more viable. If indeed the trading empires could completely enforce their exclusive trade relationships, if they could indeed completely enforce monopolies, then prices of the monopolized goods would be astronomical. And at the same time, people within the trading empire would suffer severely because the systems consistently were incapable of regularly and consistently supplying people with the goods they needed given this kind of exclusive system. As a result, smuggling and piracy, as we noted earlier, help these systems survive. They help take some of the irrationalities and reduce their impact. The empires last longer in part because of this rationalization, meaning their impact on people is not as severe as it might have been if they were totally successful in imposing exclusive relationships and imposing monopolies. Free trade and globalization also experience a certain rationalizing of their systems. 
For example, third world nationalism, third world protectionism, as it translates for our purposes here, uh, the exclusion of consumer goods in third world economies. Smuggled goods, pirated goods help meet consumer demand that might not be met otherwise. Just as starving Spanish colonists needed products that the system was unable to, su to supply, so too consumers in third world economies often get the goods that they want by turning towards pirated and uh, smuggled goods because their system largely excludes these types of products and these consumer goods. We've also seen that for many states, smuggling has a very positive impact upon the balance of payments. A third world country can say that it is in fact importing far fewer goods, spending far less of its precious foreign currency on imported goods because officially such goods have been reduced to a trickle by high tariffs and other types of barriers. When in fact many of the same goods are flowing in illegally because they're being smuggled, they're pirated goods, etc. These economies then can present themselves for foreign loans on the grounds that they do have substantial foreign currency available to pay for those loans, when in fact much of the foreign currency is simply being bled off through smuggling and piracy. But it helps these economies justify foreign loans because their balance sheet looks so much better since so much of the trade is going on off the books. We've also seen that it helps in terms of providing competition for state-run or state-encouraged monopolies. The government encourages certain types of industrial monopolies which then have no serious competition except for the fact that foreign consumer goods are being imported by smuggling methods they're being pirated, and they serve as competition for the monopoly, helping make the monopoly more efficient because it does have to compete, in fact, with these smuggled and pirated goods. In a few cases, uh, Paraguay would be an example, uh, smuggling has become a development strategy. Not officially, of course, but the fact is uh, many economies, and Paraguay is only one striking example, have tried to establish growth based on massive piracy and smuggling of goods, uh, providing themselves with home industries, if you will, in the form of copying electronic games or CDs or DVDs, etc. Uh, many of the struggling economies of Eastern Europe, we saw Bulgaria, etc., have essentially allowed this to happen. In some ways, government support is direct government industries have been used to do it as a way of reviving their economies. So in fact, smuggling and piracy can become ways of initiating certain degrees of indigenous development uh, by pirating such goods and by smuggling them. So it may not just help the so-called legitimate economy by providing competition for monopolies. It may become a major way of stimulating that economy. What about the politics of piracy and smuggling? How do they fit in? And we've certainly spent some time talking about the politics of piracy and smuggling over the last 12 weeks. Pirates were seen, in many cases, can be the allies of trading empires. We saw this with the Barbarossas. The Barbarossas became close allies of the Ottoman Sultan, and in fact, eventually, the younger brother emerges as the admiral of the Ottoman navy. Sir Francis Drake provided tremendous support for the growth of England's naval and international ambitions by attacking, by preying on the Spanish Empire. So oftentimes, pirates are in fact the allies of trading empires, and they have the advantage that you can attack your enemy and yet disclaim any direct responsibility because, of course, it was not your navy conducting the attack. It was some pirate, a pirate, of course, whom you have given permission to and assisted in some ways, who's carrying out this kind of attack. Pirates can help extend the reach of states as they reach into areas. We saw this in the Caribbean as the British and the French want to make inroads in on uh, Spain's control of the Caribbean. One of the key ways they do this is by using pirates privateers uh, to open up spaces for them, create space for themselves. And many of the ventures of the Portuguese and other Europeans in the Pacific, in the Asian trade markets, uh, 
uh, in the 1500s and even early 1600s were little more than pirating adventures. Uh, as much as they may claim otherwise, the fact is this was really piracy, certainly from the perspective of the Asians who were subject to these attacks. So in many ways, pirates serve as a critical tool for the extension of state power into regions that are still heavily contested or perhaps controlled by another empire. And of course, it is an effective way of undermining one's rivals. Uh, the Spanish and the Ottomans were certainly doing this to each other in the Mediterranean in the age of the Barbarossas, and we have seen essentially a European free-for-all in the Spanish main in the 1600s and 1700s as these imperial powers fought one another for territory and trade and not infrequently used pirates as a key mechanism for carrying this out. We also saw in a sort of unusual case smugglers as political rebels. We saw the case of the New England merchants who were heavily engaged in smuggling, who saw the changing policies of British trade as detrimental to their interests and helped promote and played a key role in the coming of the American Revolution in the late 1700s. And we also saw how these same people assisted the American Revolution by securing smuggled military goods from a free zone, a free port, St. Eustatius in the Caribbean, that helped supply uh, the Continental Army, helped make the revolution militarily feasible because of their smuggling activities. So they actually can have an impact on the political process itself. At the same time, we also know that one of the factors that makes piracy and smuggling possible is the weakness of the state. And we saw classic examples with the pirates of the South China Sea and with drug smugglers from Colombia that in both cases we're dealing with states who have seriously eroded state mechanisms in terms of being able to enforce the will of the state upon regions or upon large groups of people. And in those cases, we have instances where you know, pirates aren't assisting in the growth of the state, helping to extend its power. Quite the opposite. In this case, they're taking advantage of the weakness of the state to pursue certain activities for their own benefit, knowing that this state system, at least at this point in time, is incapable of being able to control them in any kind of effective manner. So, this political process can work both ways. It can assist the American Revolution, it can assist the expansion of trading empires like England and France and others, but it can also work against states that are too weak to actually seize and use the pirates and smugglers for their own purposes. It can rebound, and in the case of weak states, they find themselves victimized by pirates and smugglers because they don't have the kind of power that they need to either suppress these groups or use them to their best advantage. At the same time, uh, in the political arena, smugglers and pirates can actually help maintain political stability. If we look at this both in terms of trading empires and in terms of more recent developments in the 20th and 21st centuries, the fact is that the activities of pirates and smugglers often help maintain stability within societies. If we look at England and England's seemingly endless efforts to control the use, the import, and the consumption of things like tea, but especially tobacco, and realize that these were policies bound to foment deep-seated unrest within such a society. If we look at third world protectionism in the 20th century and see again people being cut off from products that they want and creating deep unrest among groups that feel that they are being unfairly penalized for the purposes of larger development projects. Smugglers actually help ease those problems. Same with prohibition, where American thirst for alcohol was not being satisfied because of prohibition. Actually, social unrest is positively impacted, is diminished by the fact that smugglers and pirates help ease some of that discontent, that unrest. Same with American colonists under the British system. Tea could be smuggled in and other products could be smuggled in that were generally not available. The economy would function better because of smuggling, because it gave people access to lower cost products than they could get from the official British system. In all of these cases, it has a positive social impact. It will contribute to a more pacific uh, 
social situation when people have less reason for unrest and particularly uh, reasons for unrest that blame the state for shortages or inadequacies within the economy. In all of these instances, we were talking about the 1600s in England, uh, the late 20th century in third world countries. In all of these instances, piracy and smuggling actually has a beneficial effect, may indeed promote social stability. Now in this next slide, I have a quote from Karl Marx for you that I've just put a a portion on, and I'm going to read it to you, you don't have to worry about recording the whole thing. Uh, it's felt fairly short, but uh, Marx wrote this, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances found, given, and transmitted from the past. Now, what's Marx talking about and why am I bother quoting him? <laughs> what he's saying is that, yes, individuals, groups of people, can affect their own history. They can change their history. But they always do that in the context of larger historical realities, and that we are born into a world whose institutions, relationships have long been shaped before we made our appearance here. But we can alter history. Smugglers and pirates are people like we are, born into a world whose conditions whose institutions, whose power relationships were shaped long before they saw the light of day. Yet they found it within themselves, the ability to change the world around them. As much as they had to deal with the realities that they were born into, they could change and alter the world around them. And that's precisely what they did. And we have seen pirates and smugglers as social and economic rebels, as people and now all of them, of course, some of them were probably just psychopaths or criminals, but many of them do engage in activity, which is clearly a rebellion against the social and economic hierarchies into which they were born, a refusal to accept the existing system. Freebooters, for example, uh, in the 18th century in the Spanish Main, uh, these people clearly are the types of rebels that we're talking about. They are the social and economic rebels of the 17th and 18th centuries, rebelling against imperial systems, rebelling against systems where there was a clear hierarchy, where a privileged few gained much of the wealth within society, where there was at best miserable treatment of people who were uh, seamen who spent their lives uh, working the sailing ships of the 17th and 18th century, these people were in rebellion against those conditions in a very open and dramatic fashion. They defied the economic privileges of their age, which largely said that it is to the well-to-do, to the elite, to those who own plantations in the New World, those who are uh, the owners of landed estates and noble titles at home, these people defied those conventions, attempting to seize some share of that wealth with little concern or regard for these social and economic conventions of their time. We also saw that within the subcultures, the societies created by pirates, as much as they may be transitory, in other words, these were not societies that were going to last for centuries, they didn't have permanent institutions that would help preserve them, nevertheless, they did create a system which largely was a reaction against the existing social order in which they lived. For example, the role of women as pirates. We've seen this particularly with China, but in the West there are a number of prominent women pirates as well. These were not roles that were generally accepted as appropriate for women. In fact, particularly in the West, they were largely excluded from such roles, uh, working the great ships uh, of the 18th century, and yet women found a place for themselves within these societies, a direct rebellion against the role and condition of women in many of these societies at the time that these people engaged in piracy. Homosexuality, uh, which was quite common in bisexuality as well, quite common in pirate societies as we have seen both in the West and in Asia. This again is the creation of human relationships that are at odds with the dominant culture from which these people have emerged. They are creating an alternative culture with alternative values, that this homosexuality and bisexuality are commonly practiced by pirates, uh, direct uh, rebellion against the kind of society in which they had grown up 
uh, creation, creating an alternative culture, if you will. And democracy. These were not democratic societies uh, that we have seen, you know, whether we're talking about Western societies in the 17th or 18th or 19th centuries, or talking about China in the 19th century. These were not democratic societies. These were hierarchical societies where the vast majority of the population still had very little say in the outcome of day-to-day -day political events in how the state operated and what policies it pursued. In contrast to that, the pirates often, though not always, but often set up democratic systems. They had committees. They elected their captains. Uh, they decided by a vote how wealth would be distributed within their system. So you're also getting a version of economic democracy, not just political democracy. We also have racial democracy because we see the cases of black pirates, for example, who are becoming captains of pirate vessels. Again, a far cry from the subordinated role that they had experienced, particularly in the colonial societies of the West. So in all these cases, these people are making their own history. Yes, they have to accept that the larger reality is a series of hierarchies, economic, social, racial, that exist in the world around them. But they do rebel against that, and for a time they are able to create alternative societies with alternative relationships, alternative values. And this is what is so striking about pirates and smugglers uh, in these earlier centuries. The same may also be said to a degree about such people in the 20th century. If we think about it, if we look at, for example, the informal economy, we looked at the district of Tepito in Mexico City, we look at the island of San Andres off Colombia's coast, where informal economies operate openly and on a massive scale. These people, again, are defying the conventions of their societies. Their societies say that, look at those who do well, those who have an important role to play in commerce within our society are those who are wealthy and can own department stores or at least moderately well off so that they can have a store of their own. Uh, those who play by the rules, who pay the taxes, who import goods legally. And these people act in defiance of those rules. And they throw those aside and say, no, you don't need a lot of money. You can start with a little bit of capital because we'll use smuggled goods, we'll use pirated goods. And no, we're not going to pay taxes and we're not going to pay for all these licenses that you have to have to start up a business. These people, as much as an 18th century freebooter, are rebels against the existing system, trying to create an alternative. Pirates and smugglers, in many ways in the 20th century, are defying the rules of globalization. What are some of the rules? Well, you have to respect intellectual property rights. You can't uh, allow certain goods in, uh, such as uh, goods that have been banned or on which high tariffs have been imposed. And they say, well, no, we don't care. Hmm. Uh, we're going to do it anyways. Even though you know, your rules say that we can't copy software without a license, etc., we're going to do it. We're going to redistribute wealth within our society. We're going to take advantage of the fact that these products have great value and yet we're not going to pay the fees, we're not going to pay for the licenses that are required for usage of those products. We're going to defy the rules of the game. So pirates and smugglers of the 20th and 21st centuries are in some ways very similar to the rebels of the pirate communities of the 18th century. Drug cultures represent another aspect of this that we've talked about controlled substances, the trade in controlled substances during especially the 20th century and efforts to control that, those products. It's important to look at these groups as well in terms of systems of control by the state and people's rebellion against those systems. The fact is that when we look around the globe, over the past 500 years, we find that in many societies, the production and consumption of various drugs, uh, whether it involves opium or involves uh, coca leaves, has been commonly practiced over hundreds of years. And that furthermore, substantial groups within various societies in Asia, in the Middle East, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, have made it a part of their financial well-being, their economic system, uh, the growing and use of those products 
uh, and sometimes they also have religious and cultural significance in terms of their use. For these groups, the war on drugs and the effort to create a global system that will control and largely eliminate uh, trade in these controlled substances has been uh, rejected as an attack upon their lifestyle, upon their very basic economic interests. One thing about the effort to ban certain controlled substances, to largely eliminate them from world trade, is that it is very much a product of the power of the 20th century state. In other words, this type of control over human activity, you know, human decision making to use drugs, etc., would not have been possible in the earlier centuries. As much as we look back to the great Chinese emperors and think of the kings and queens of Europe, etc., uh, and think of the enormous power that they must have exercised, in fact, their power over their own societies was minuscule compared to what a modern 20th century state can do. I mean, if you look at this country, for example, how much information uh, does the federal government have about you as an individual? Can it quickly collect about you as an individual? Whether it's your tax returns, your social security account, legal documents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, your driver's license, your uh, passport, all types of information, your credit history, et cetera, can easily be accessed and controlled by the state. The state has enormous power. We have seen this exercised often in a very negative way by totalitarian states during the 20th century. But that also means those same powers are available to any state in the 20th century, even though it may not be totalitarian. And the effort to control drugs is one example. That state has made a political decision that the consumption of certain drugs is detrimental to the interests of society, and it is now going to attempt to control the decision-making process of millions of human beings within its society by controlling access and use of such substances. The emphasis particularly on interdiction has helped set up the same kinds of relationships that we have seen when, again, countries, trading empires establish monopolies, when they establish high tariff barriers, it has the same effect. In other words, you're not reducing demand. It's just like a third world country saying, well, we're going to put a 400 percent uh, import duty on all foreign-made automobiles. Uh, we haven't done anything to temper the demand of people for those automobiles. What we've done is essentially raise the price of those automobiles, making it much more difficult for people to acquire them. You create immediately ideal conditions for smuggling. So too with drug interdiction, since you're not really doing a lot to decrease demand within the population, well, instead what you're doing, or trying to do at least, is dramatically raise the price of the product, reduce its availability, and eliminate your problem in that fashion. But the effect is the same as the tariff in the third world economy, and that is demand stays high, prices go up, and the smugglers immediately enter for their opportunity to resolve, to rationalize the huge gap between the demand for the product and its current price given state policies. That kind of process is now taking place, not only in this country where it's been taking place for decades, but of course increasingly we're trying to do it around the world. So it's now become a global policy to try to interdict, interdict uh, the drug trade and try to reduce demand and reduce usage in that fashion. And as we have seen, of course, raising tremendously uh, the opportunities for smuggling of such products. One of the effects of these policies, and we have saw this when we talked about prohibition, uh, we also saw it with drugs. When you go back and look at uh, the smuggling of marijuana, uh, let's say back in the 1940s and 50s, uh, particularly even we can estimate at least into the early 60s, it's sort of amateur hour. I mean, people are engaging in uh, this kind of smuggling activity, but they're not really smuggling professionals. It's not what they do all the time, just as in uh, the early days of prohibition, the kinds of people that were involved were doing it uh, to make a few extra dollars. They usually had regular jobs, uh, or they were doing it temporarily to uh, gain some money to help them because they're unemployed. Uh, they were not doing this on a full-time basis. But as the state imposes greater restrictions and enforcement, those people 
course, are going to turn away from the ideas of smuggling because the penalty to be paid is much higher as the state increases those penalties and the likelihood of getting caught increases because the state is using more of its power to impose this interdiction. So we're talking about prohibition in the 20s or uh, drug interdiction by the late 60s, certainly 70s and 80s and beyond. We're looking at a similar kind of process and that the more the state works to interdict this prohibited traffic, the more it drives out the amateurs and the more that criminal cartels will enter into the activity because they have the capital to counter interdiction efforts. They, as criminals, are willing to take the risk of higher penalties because of the enormous profits they see here. So actually, the enemy becomes far more powerful over time because the enemy is no longer sort of, you know, the, the weekend smuggler. Uh, instead, the enemy is now uh, the professional gangster uh, of the Prohibition era or the drug cartel of the last quarter of the 20th century. Either way, we get a far more menacing enemy because of these policies, because the more that they try to interdict, the more they drive out the amateurs, the more we're faced with highly professional groups who engage in this kind of smuggling. So we've looked at a wide variety of issues in the course. We've looked at some of the economic realities of global systems and how trading empires aren't that different from globalization in terms of both having rules of entry, both having exclusivist aspects uh, to their operation and creating advantaged and disadvantaged groups. We've looked at the basic economic rules about you raise barriers on goods, prices go up, smuggling and piracy will follow. We've looked at the interplay between pirates and smugglers and the state, both in terms of okay, state policies to encourage smuggling or weaken states that can't control smuggling and piracy. How do pirates and smugglers actually assist the extension of state power for trading empires, pirates playing a political role in the, or smugglers playing a political role in the coming of the American Revolution. And we've looked at issues like the drug trade and how that resembles these kinds of exclusivist systems and how it too creates vast opportunities for smuggling. And we've talked about pirates and smugglers as social rebels. Not all of them, but many of them defying the social and economic conventions of their age, trying to create a very different kind of society than the one into which they are born. How do we summarize all of these keys? Well, here's a few points. Pirates and smugglers are really windows on the world for us. When we look at these people and understand the kinds of basic motives that drove them, often fundamental economic concerns about making a living, but also understand their attempts to create a larger equitable space for themselves and those around them, their reactions to the world around them. They help us understand the larger forces that have shaped the modern world, from the rise of the trading empires right down to the globalization at the beginning of the 21st century. By seeing groups of individuals and how they respond to the world around them and how they try to create an alternative, we are exposed to the inner workings of these larger forces that shape our world. When we talk about globalization and free trade and trading empires, it often comes across as very kind of dry narrative. And yet, these are vitally important forces that have affected human lives for centuries. We understand far better just how significant those are and just how human beings like ourselves have responded to these kinds of institutions and global systems over the centuries when we look at the pirates. As different as they may seem from us, they are us in many ways. Their aspirations for a better world, for one in which there is greater equity, for one in which they have greater access to wealth, their ambitions and their goals and aspirations are not very different from the people of the beginning of the 21st century, also grappling with enormous uh, 
seemingly impersonal systems and having to make choices about how they will create a world for themselves in this larger global system. We have seen at the same time that whether we're talking about trading empires, free trade, or globalization, while they seem to be on opposite ends of the spectrum, having controlled trade, monopolies on the one hand, <coughs> open trade and investment on the other, the fact is they're all in common global systems. And they have rules of entry and rules of behavior. Just as the Portuguese were issuing licenses back in the 1500s and 1600s telling Arab merchants and Hindu merchants that they had to have one of these in order to trade, so too in the 21st century, multinational corporations tell people, look, if you don't have a license, if you don't have a copyright, you can't use that product. So as different as the systems are, they also have basic similarities. And people, as we have seen, are going to respond to those strictures and often try to go around them. But it is striking how similar these systems are, as different as they appear at the surface. We have also seen that pirates and smugglers do indeed attempt to create countercultures, that they are not just looking for some economic advantage within these systems, taking advantage of the golden rule that, you know, you use barriers that raise prices, you're creating opportunities for pirates and smugglers. More than that, they're rebelling against the larger world around them. And here I've said the, from the freebooters to the Kanjali to Paraguayan pirates, meaning that all of these groups, freebooters in the 18th century Spanish Maine, the Kanjali, who you remember were Hindu admirals that fought against the attempts of the Portuguese to impose essentially a trading monopoly on the west coast of India. And of course, Paraguayans who are engaged in the pirating of licensed and copyrighted materials, all of these groups are rebelling against a system that is trying to control them. And very often, as we've seen, pirates have emerged from, from groups that were carrying out ordinary trading activities on a day-to-day -day basis, but then found a larger system being imposed upon them that threatened their way of life, or simply found themselves as the freebooters had, or the Paraguayan pirates, in a global system that greatly disadvantaged them economically. And as a result, they sought alternative systems, economic and social systems, to counter that larger system that disadvantages them, whether it's economically, or because of their race, or because of their social standing. This is an effort to counter such a global system, whether it's a trading empire or something called globalization at the beginning of the 21st century. These people are also social rebels. And if we go from the freebooters again to the real McCoy, the liquor smuggler uh, from the Caribbean during Prohibition, uh, to modern-day software pirates, these people all see themselves as rebels against a hierarchical society, a society whose strictures and restrictions they do not accept. So we have a complex picture here when we look at pirates and smugglers in the making of the modern world. And we see that, indeed, on the one hand, vast global forces have helped shape the institutions of the world economy and world societies over the last 500 years, from trading empires to the process of globalization. But we also know that within those vast, seemingly impersonal systems, groups of people have rejected these larger processes, often because they feel that they are being exploited, that they are disadvantaged within these larger systems. And it is through piracy and smuggling that they seek to create economic advantage for themselves and often to create social systems that operate outside of the norms of the societies into which they were born. It is this complex interaction of these larger global forces and the struggles of individual human beings to survive and even prosper within the systems that often disadvantage them that tells the story of pirates and smugglers and at the same time helps us understand
the larger forces that have shaped the world's economy and the world's societies over the past 500 years. We'll be back in just a minute and have a review of the second half of the course.